Watch this. And it's like, okay, but my kid needs help now. A surprising number of children are diagnosed with autism in the United States. Another surprising fact, how long Idaho parents have to wait to get that diagnosis. We've allowed them to add a cowboy hat to the uniform if they'd like. A historical accessory or a fashionable necessity. Ada County Sheriff's Office is allowing the option of an old look for its current deputies. I know what happened and how it happened and I knew it then and you know, uh, it was just a really a bad, act, a bad incident. It was also a pivotal moment in the modern day militia movement. 31 years ago, Randy Weaver refused to comply with the federal government, and the siege at Ruby Ridge became part of Idaho and American history. In the last 30 years, Idaho's population has nearly doubled. Barely a million people in 1992, little more than 1.8 million today. And with that sort of increase, you're likely to see an increase in infrastructure issues, health care hardships, and a wide range of prob problems or on how to handle them especially when you consider another number that has grown exponentially since 1992. Back then, the Centers for Disease Control said one in 150 kids, one in 150, were diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. In 2012, the CDC put that number at one in 36. This results in a long wait list for Treasure Valley parents who suspect their children might have autism but need a specialist to diagnose it, something that can take years, which is crucial time wasted for those families. Here's Andrew Bartline. Moms have a knack of wasting okay. no time when it matters most. You start at your pediatrician. Hi. At an early age to ensure their kids are safe and healthy. You go through your day to day life trying to help your kiddos the best you can while you wait. The wait. It's just been. Kirsten Rankin lives it life-changing for me. I'm a mother of three special needs kiddos. Um, all three have autism. All three detail a difficult story of getting the services and resources they need. I went into it just scared and confused and then you start calling to try to get your kid help and you're told 18 months, two years, three years, and it's like, okay, but my kid needs help now. If a child is suspected of having autism spectrum disorder, Full Circle Health says a general pediatrician could diagnose an obvious case, yeah. but autism is a spectrum and a specialist is often needed to determine the level of nuance and it costs time. The wait list, for example, for my oldest was 18 months. And that's just to get the appointment scheduled, not to actually be seen by the specialist. He would be very violent, very aggressive just couldn't calm down, couldn't sit still. Anytime we took him out into the community, he would just dysregulate, scream, yell. What people don't get is they don't choose that. It's one of the more frustrating parts. And it's nobody's fault. Including the doctors and specialists. They're incredible, they're incredible people. There are some amazing therapists and doctors in this valley and they very much wanna help and their staff very much wants to help. There just isn't enough of them and Full Circle Health's Dr. Perry Brown for length has says there are few local resources to evaluate autism spectrum disorder. And just because a specialist isn't available, and a lot of times you get stares, doesn't mean they aren't seen. Um, you get comments and your kids are judged, pretty traumatic experiences being judged for things that they can't control. And a mom can only do her best too. Being persistent, persistence is key. It's more time than Kirsten wanted to spend the last two and a half years have been a journey. But worth the price. I know with my oldest, it's been life changing for us with him being on the right medication because he's getting the help that he needs. He's getting the services that he needs. Costs a lot of real money too, not just time. Kirsten was explaining to me her individual situation with insurance, Medicaid coverage, what they could or couldn't cover. Her youngest, she says, is nonverbal. He has very specific services that he needs. One of those would be a helmet, for example. She said it took a year just to get through the process of finding a referral, getting a fitting. That whole year long process, they were concerned that their son would hurt himself in the meantime. So you imagine multiplying that by three across three kids. Very yeah. difficult individual situation for her and her family, but across the board, there are families that are waiting three years to find out what exactly is my kid's situation and what does my kid need. And not to simplify this, but of course, this is just another example of the growing pains here in Idaho. When the population increases like mm -hmm. that, you're gonna get a wide variety of people that move here and that are born here. 
and the limit when it comes to how many doctors stay in this state. Yeah, I mean, I know we've reported that across the board on other things, other situations. It just seems to be another wrinkle, and there's a need for health care that maybe isn't being filled right now. Right. Try and get in touch with St. Luke's on what their situation is, um, and we should have more from them later today. We're going to get that in our web story here at ktbb.com. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. Ada County was established by the Idaho Territorial Legislature back in 1864. And back then it was common for lawmen to wear the headgear of the times, you know, like a 10 gallon wide brimmed bucket, a cowboy hat, if you will, even if punching cows wasn't your thing. And that style lasted a very long time. I mean, take a look at this Ada County Sheriff's Office photo from the late 1950s. Sheriff Myron Gilbert and his staff and you can see how many deputies in this photo are wearing a wide brimmed hat. I think there's like nine of the 13 there in the background. Sheriff Gilbert there in the front also wearing one and several others out there by the car. It appears bow ties were also kind of optional at that time. Back then, though, they had about two dozen deputies in the Ada County Sheriff's Office. And a lot has changed since then. Sheriff's Office employs hundreds of deputies now and somewhere along the way. The way of the lawmen in Western wear, that went away as well. But now it's being brought back, sort of. Not as a standard, but more of just because of health care. Here's Joe Paris. There is a change on the streets of Ada County. Deputies may soon look a little different to you. We've allowed them to add a cowboy hat to the uniform if they'd like. Ada County Sheriff Matt Clifford says some of his deputies tried the cowboy hat look at the Eagle Rodeo. Trying to beat the heat, it was a hit. And then what the final straw, uh, no pun intended. The final straw was uh, I was out in CUNA at an event and the sun was just beating down on me. I was wearing this uniform. I had a, a detective next to me who's trying to hide under a baseball cap to keep the sun off of him. And I went out and bought a cowboy hat the next day and I wore it to the Star 4th of July the hometown celebration. Some deputies debuted the new look at the Western Idaho Fair. They got great feedback on their new look from Idahoans, Clifford says. There are rules with the hats that deputies must follow. First, they are optional. Deputies still have the option to wear an Ada County style baseball cap if they want. Hats can only be worn with the traditional tan uniform and they must be of the white straw variety. If the hat has any brands or anything like that, not allowed to display any logo, symbols, emblems, pins, anything like that. The classic look to a Western Sheriff's Office and I mean, we're a Western Sheriff's Office and I've always kind of liked that look. I'm not a cowboy. Uh, in fact, I know very little about cowboy hats. Sheriff Clifford does know that the hats are not only a cool Western look, but they also serve a very real purpose. We've had some deputies here that are, you know, we're all hitting the dermatologist. Uh, they're out in the sun quite a bit. They're getting, you know, spots frozen off here and there. We've also had, uh, you know, a number of people that have gone in. And it's not all related to the job they do here, but they're getting melanomas cut off of them. Uh, and I had a uh, I had a family member die last year from skin cancer, and that really kind of hit home. Uh, where I, you know, you don't. It seems like when you talk about skin cancer, all you hear about is, well, I got it frozen off, I got it cut off, um, and then to have somebody pass away, you re realize how serious it is. And so uh, I've been trying to stay out of the sun a lot more, and along comes this cowboy hat idea, and it really works great. And to answer your question at home, yes, the sheriff has his hat ready to roll. New hat. New hat, so I've, I've had this one since uh, the day before, or just before 4th of July, so I think July 1st. So like I said, I'm not, I'm not a, a cowboy guy, but I, I got one that I thought looked okay and fits my head. So straw hats, they aren't great for the winter and the cold temperature. So Brian, the search is on for the Ada County Sheriff's Office. They're gonna get some good felt hats that they could wear during the, uh, the, the winter, colder months. So that's, that's an ongoing effort. And I do yeah. wanna say for everyone counting pennies at home, this is not going to cost any taxpayer dollars. Ada County is not buying hats for the deputies. They're not giving okay. them you know, hats at a cost. If you wanna go buy your own hat as a deputy and it falls within the, the rules, you can do that. Do we know why they just kinda of went away? Like looking at that old photo back in the late 50s, early 60s, I mean, they just kinda of just, for lack of a better term, just went out of fashion? Yeah, I was talking with the, the sheriff's office for the story and Sheriff Clifford says they think in the 70s or 80s is kinda of when they got, uh, you know, phased out for whatever reason at the time. And so it's been decades since the Ada County Sheriff's Office, probably since the 70s or 80s, yeah. since you would see a sheriff deputy in a hat like that. But they're back. How long will it last? Is this going to be successful? Will other departments around here copy? We'll see. And to be clear, by the way, Ada County is not the only uh, law enforcement agency that allows cowboy hats like this. No, you see ISP has the bright brim hat, but I've noticed over the last 10 years or so, 
agencies across the West have picked this up as kind of their thing too. Yeah, it is. It's a cultural good. thing too. Yeah, so for sure. All right, thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. I'll be talking about cowboy hats and that kind of stuff on the 208, but there's a lot of other things you probably need to know about that happening in our area code. And with today's 411, here's Morgan Romero. And that has to do with other DNA profiles down at the scene. Brian Koberger's murder trial is still scheduled to start in October. Late Friday, a Latah County judge denied his request to pause court proceedings to give his attorneys more time to collect and examine evidence against him and plan a better defense. The judge didn't buy that argument and kept Koberger's trial on the calendar for October 2nd. He's accused of murdering four University of Idaho students last fall in an off-campus home. If he's convicted, Koberger faces the death penalty. Hurricane Hillary hitting Mexico head on and doing her best to help with wildfires here in Idaho. That includes the Elkhorn Fire burning in the Nez Perce Clearwater National Forest. It's still the largest at more than 26,000 acres, but the rain is slowing it a bit. However, the hurricane could add another safety wrinkle for firefighters who have to watch for possible landslides and flash floods. In fact, the National Weather Service issued a flood watch in the area through Tuesday evening. Right now, the Elkhorn Fire is 68% contained. And at more than 24,000 acres, the Hayden Fire is still burning south of Salmon. Still no word on how that one started back on July 19th. Rain is hopefully getting a handle on the East Fire burning 10 miles east of Cascade. It's now just over 3,300 acres with 0% containment. Something the rain didn't help, the Western Idaho Fair. They delayed their opening today from noon to 2 p.m. And if you were planning to see us, no luck. We apparently don't do well with water falling from the sky and we'll be there Thursday instead. Admission is still $7 today as part of KTVB Day. And if you don't mind the wind, you can still enjoy the fair from inside the several buildings and barns that are part of the fun. That's the 411 on the 208. I'm Morgan Romero. It was an 11 day standoff to begin 31 years ago today. Ruby Ridge became a unifying moment in the anti-government movement, sparked by a boy chasing his dog. Do you have any interesting history for us? Or maybe you want us to discover some for you. Text us, 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name and the hashtag the 208. Or maybe you have something to say about what we've talked about today. Keep them clean, keep them concise. Oh, and clever helps. We might share yours at the end of the show. You know, anytime an armed anti-authority activist takes a stand against a government agency, you can bet two words come to mind. Ruby Ridge. That one incident in 1992, many experts believe, added more fuel to an already smoldering anti-government militia movement, one that led to violence in several cases. You can think Waco the following year, Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. The seeds of the siege at Ruby Ridge were planted a year and a half earlier, though, in January of 1991 when Randy Weaver, a former Army engineer, was arrested by the Boundary County Sheriff and ATF agents, agents 
on weapons charges for having a sawed off shotgun. Weaver was released on bond, but when he didn't show up for a court, uh, for court hearing, a judge issued an arrest warrant for his failure to appear, even though the court date he was given was incorrect. Well, that's when the U.S. Marshal Service took over, and they tried several times to negotiate a peaceful surrender, knowing he and his family were well armed. But Weaver, a known survivalist and white nationalist, refused to leave his cabin. And what would become the rallying cry for Second Amendment rights advocates and anti-government overreach was first heard on this day in North Idaho 31 years ago. For months, federal agents' eyes were on the cabin and compound of the Weavers. But what many believed was the beginning of the modern militia movement actually came on the heels of a boy following his dog on August 21st, 1992. That day, the Weaver's dogs alerted to something outside the cabin. Randy Weaver went to check it out. So did his 14-year-old son, Sammy, and family friend, Kevin Harris. They went a different direction than Randy, though, trailing a yellow lab named Stryker. What they didn't know was earlier in the day, six U.S. Marshals went into the trees with the hope of watching and eventually arresting Weaver. Weaver saw them and ran back to the cabin. But Stryker led Sammy right to the federal agents shortly after. And what happened next has been disputed since. On August 21st, 1992, shots rang out in the remote hills of northern Idaho. You know, it was right about, it's funny, this time I got the call. Idaho's U.S. Marshal Mike Johnson had a deputy stationed at Ruby Ridge that day. Johnson explained it this way to KTVB 10 years later. The initial shootout that occurred uh, of who shot first, we'll never know. What we do know is that U.S. Deputy Marshal Bill Deegan and Randy Weaver's 14-year-old son both died in that exchange. It was the beginning of an 11-day standoff at Ruby Ridge. Before it was over, Weaver's wife was also shot and killed. In another confrontation with the feds the following day, Randy Weaver was shot by an FBI sniper. So was Harris. The bullet that hit Harris also hit Vicki Weaver. She was standing behind the cabin door, holding her 10-month-old baby when Harris ran in. Authorities still can't predict how long this ordeal will drag on, but now that Randy Weaver's finally talking, they say there's real hope of resolving this standoff without further bloodshed. The days that followed... It's gonna happen to us all! ...saw more confrontations outside the perimeter of Ruby Ridge, as dozens of protesters... This is not Aryan Nation! Stuff. And hundreds of federal agents descended on North Idaho. I want you to know we remain very positive. The plan that's in effect to bring about a situation where we can have this situation resolved without any loss of life. That's our objective. Well, Stryker, the Yellow Lab, was also killed in that initial confrontation. And after negotiating with former Green Beret Bo Gritz, Harris surrendered on August 30th. Weaver would turn himself in the next day. During his trial, Weaver would be acquitted of most of the serious charges against him, and Harris was acquitted of, all, acquitted of all of his charges. The Weaver family surviving members filed a wrongful death case for the death of Sammy and Vicki. Randy Weaver received a $100,000 settlement. His three children each received a $1,000,000 in 1995. Randy Weaver died in May of last year at the age of 74.
What a couple of days it has been as far as rainfall goes. And I have never in my weather career talked about tropical moisture coming in to southwest Idaho and eastern Oregon. But that's exactly what has been soaking us since last night into today. So here's our two day rain totals for places like McCall, Ontario and Caldwell, though almost all of this rain fell today since midnight. Haley picked up much of their rain yesterday, but still McCall now well over two inches. Haley not far from it. Ontario an inch and a half and Caldwell three quarters of an inch of rain has fallen in the last 24 to 36 hours or so, courtesy of the remnants of what was Tropical Storm Hillary and Hurricane Hillary. And this is how it looked from the top of Tamarack Resort today. You couldn't see a whole lot because of the storm clouds and the rain obscuring the view. You saw a break in the action briefly. If you blinked, you missed it because now we have another storm that is saturating McCall again. So Long Valley not out of the woods as far as those storms go. You can see Boise didn't pick up all that much and this is what we expected. We did expect most of the intense rainfall from from this system to be west of Boise. Still a third of an inch of rain is a record for Boise for August 21st. Ontario's one and a half inches shattering a daily record. Same with McCall. In fact, for Ontario, that's more than we normally see in Ontario for the entire summer just picked up today. So yes, an unprecedented rain event for sure. Temperature wise today in Jerome and Twin Falls, where it's been relatively dry, 82 degrees for Jerome, 83 in Twin Falls. We did jump up briefly to 85 in Boise, we're back down now into the upper 70s. Ontario, it has been a cool, wet, windy, soggy day. Only 72 degrees, the observed high temperature in Ontario so far. It looks stormy still across the region. You can tell we're not out of the woods yet. Twin Falls, the warmest point right now at 81 degrees. And yes, we do have thunderstorms firing off in central Idaho. As we zoom in, you see the action here from Gooding almost straight north towards Fairfield and Sun Valley. Heavy rain, abundant lightning strikes, and so much so that we have a flash flood warning that's just been issued issued for northwestern Gooding County because of the heavy rain with these storms and generally for central Idaho and northeast Oregon. Still, we have a flood watch that's in effect through midnight tonight for the possibility of these storms dropping more heavy rain, kind of adding insult to injury right at this point. But our atmosphere is so saturated because of the remnants of that tropical storm, which now are to the north. But we have so much available moisture, general instability because of this system that anywhere we get that daytime heating, we will see those storms develop. We have the possibility of more isolated storms tomorrow, maybe even some rain showers in Boise in the morning. Temperatures hold steady below average in the low 80s the next couple of days, but by Wednesday we start drying out. The sunshine will emerge. Thursday looks gorgeous, upper 80s. Slight chance of a couple more storms on Friday, then a hot and sunny weekend coming our way.
All right, several people knowing what it's like to have kids on the autism spectrum, like this one here from Amy in Boise. I have two kids that are on the autistic spectrum disorder, but they are high functioning, which is a blessing compared to those who are speechless or non-functioning children. I too know that it was very hard to get a true diagnosis, and after their diagnosis, we were able to get the kids on IEPs, which is individual education plans in schools, and that's the important part too. It's not just the healthcare and the doctors that you get to see, but also how your kids progress through school, because without that diagnosis, well, then you don't get that access to the special ed that is much needed in schools, of course. What is often ignored about Ruby Ridge is that there was a warrant issued by the court for Weaver's arrest. He did not have the right to resist that arrest. He had the right to appear in court and plead his case. He chose not to, says David in Boise County. That's correct. And everybody admits that was involved in this. There were a lot of things that went wrong with this. Starting from that beginning, a wrong court date on his documents that said when he had to appear. He didn't show up. The judge issued that bench warrant and refused to change it, even though he knew that there was an incorrect date on Randy Weaver's paperwork. I was an Ada County deputy in the 70s. We wore felt Stetsons. They went to campaign hats and later bus driver hats in the early 80s. And if you are not knowing what a campaign hat is, that's kind of like the one the Smokey wears. And this is the campaign hat. Look at this one right here. Looks just like that one right there. I had to look it up too. Good to know. We'll be back tomorrow.